Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to start the Science A Core Biology Part One Hangout. And again, if you're new to the Hangouts, it'd be useful if you have yourself a pen and a paper handy, and always a calculator. And hopefully, you should be able to hear me okay too. If you're looking at this through Frog, don't forget we have a comments box. As we go through, if there's any questions that you've got, just post them on there and I'll do my best to answer them. So this is biology part one. For this topic, we're gonna to be looking at the following. We're gonna have a look at diet. We're gonna move on to disease. Then we're gonna look at the nervous system and hormones. And finally, we're gonna end on homeostasis and drugs. This is approximately half of the content that we're gonna need for the exam, which is very imminent. And we'll look at the other parts during the next session. So part one, we're gonna have a look at diet. Now specifically, we need to identify what it is that makes a healthy diet. Well, the key word for the exam here is balanced. We need to balance all of our nutrients. And you need to know the seven nutrients there are. So we've got ourselves the carbohydrates, we have proteins and fats. We also then have minerals, vitamins, fiber, and finally, water. And it's important for a healthy diet that these are all balanced. We're having a suitable amount of each one. Now further to that, quite simply, if we're having too much of a particular nutrient, or even too much food, then we're gonna have specific problems. These problems could be obesity, where we're simply putting on too much fat. We could find that actually we cause diabetes, type two diabetes. We could find that we have high blood pressure. In fact, there's all sorts of associated problems with an unbalanced, unhealthy diet, too much salt, too much sugar. Furthermore, though, if we don't have enough food, there are also severe issues. And this affects many, many people in the developing world. So it could be that we have slower growth rates. We could be finding that we have fatigue, that we are less resistant to infection. We feel a little bit run down. Any type of malnourishment, a lack of food, causes all sorts of issues. And there's specific diseases. So the specific lack of vitamin C can cause problems such as scurvy, bleeding of the gums, losing teeth. So diet needs to be balanced, and we need to make sure that it's healthy. We're having a suitable amount of each of the different types of nutrient. On top of that, specifically in the exam, they tend to ask how lifestyle and diet are linked. They often give tables such as this, looking at how much energy is being used in certain activities. And that energy is normally measured in kilojoules, or it could be in calories. Now, essentially, the more food that we take in, the more energy that we're giving ourselves without using it up, then the more weight we will gain. 
And again, it comes down to this balance. They're also likely to ask you to evaluate diets or products with content in. So look out for quantities of salt, quantities of sugar. You don't need to know these numbers, but we're allowed on average about 30 grams of extra sugar per day. And something like a can of Coke will have seven grams of sugar in it. And so it might be evaluating how healthy this is for us. Finally, with diet, we have this word metabolic rate. How much energy our body needs to function. If you're a fit person that does lots of exercise, has lots of muscle, you're going to increase the amount of energy you need. Your metabolic rate will go up. The converse is also true. If you're someone that doesn't do much exercise, works in a job where you're sat down all day, you might find that your metabolic rate is much slower. And so you pile on the pounds much more readily. And in which case, you need to be thinking about keeping it balanced and looking at your rate of exercise. Now, it'd be wrong to say, simply cut out your food. That is not a healthy option. You must keep a balanced diet, but you might look at potentially reducing the food intake whilst remaining with all the key nutrients, or maybe looking at doing more exercise. The final word that comes into all of this is a phrase known as BMI, our body mass index. Now you don't need the calculation, but it's your weight over your height squared. And there's a suitable safe range. Anywhere between about 18.5 and 25 means you're in a healthy overall body mass index. If you go below 18.5, then you're in danger of being underweight. And anything over, you're in danger of being overweight. So it's all about the balance, keeping the correct nutrients being absorbed, allowing for a healthy lifestyle. Now, in terms of questions, and if you're new to these Hangouts, again, you might want to pause them as I start talking through and looking them at your own time. And you can come straight back in and you'll be taken off where you left. I'll give you a minute or so to have a look at this and then we'll talk about the answers for it. Again, with any exam, it's always useful to highlight the key things that the actual question is showing us. So, in this particular question, scientists investigate the effectiveness of free slimming programs. And they recalled the body mass of four groups of volunteers each month for six months. Each group is given a different slimming program. And the fourth group is a control. We then have a graph that shows the mean change of body mass for all four groups. And each of the four groups are highlighted in the key here. They're given a different line. So let's take a look at the first question. What should our control group eat? Well, we're not asking for this group to have anything to do with a slimming program. So we want them to eat their normal food. In other words, we don't want them to change. The second question, you're being asked about why the control group was placed for this particular experiment. Well, very simply, is to allow us to compare results, to identify did the slimming programs work, or did this particular group lose weight, in which case something else might be at play. So this is our first part of the question. For the second, 
I've included the graph again. And the question goes as such. The three groups of volunteers using the slimming programs each showed similar pattern of body mass loss. For two marks, so we need two separate points, what is the pattern? Well, if we look at the graph, we've got this one line here that fluctuates a little bit. And that particular group is our control. But the other three groups are all showing essentially the same pattern. The first part is there is a very big loss. So there's a loss to begin with. I mean, you might want to be specific, but in the first three months, this is where the loss is greatest. We then have, in the second part, a slowing or a leveling. In other words, they've lost most weight to begin with, and then it's begun to level off. Now, finally, for the fourth question, the question states that all the slimming programs seem to be effective. How does the information in this graph show us? Well, in comparison to our control group, which doesn't really change, all the others have had a drastic loss. They've all lost their mean body mass. They've all lost some mean body mass in comparison to the control. So our mark would say they have had a positive effect with their slimming programs. And so that's diet. That's our first part. Now, the second part that we need to look at are diseases. And this is often a set of questions that come up in every single paper. So, specifically, the very first part that we need to look at is how do we fight disease, or maybe what is disease? Well, for core science, there's three words that we need to know. First of all, we've got bacteria. Now, bacteria are tiny. They're about a hundredth the size of a normal body cell. But they are very small, complete organisms. The second type is a virus. Now, a virus is even smaller. A virus is about a hundredth the size of a bacterium. So these are absolutely tiny. But they're not cells. They're small fragments. And they don't have an ability to replicate themselves. Unlike bacteria, which can very quickly replicate, viruses need to come into our body and use our own body's cells, the own mechanisms of our body, to replicate themselves. And when they do that, they use the machinery of the cell and they overwhelm it. They replicate massively and essentially break the cell and go in and find new cells to target. Now, bacteria and viruses collectively are known as pathogens. And just be aware of that word because they might talk about pathogens. They might even talk about microorganisms. But we're thinking of bacteria and viruses. Now, while we're on that subject, Bacteria can quite readily be killed. We can kill them with antibiotics. The antibiotics will target the bacteria and destroy them. But with a virus, we have no such luck. The only thing that we can be given for a virus is painkillers. We need to wait for our body to actually fight off the virus. Well, how does it do that? Specifically, we have white blood cells. And white blood cells will engulf our particular 
foreign bodies and digest them and get rid of them. It will also produce antibodies. The white blood cells will go around essentially trying to find the unique molecules, the antigens, on the surface of the foreign bodies and find particular ways to deal with them. But this takes time. So when we get an illness, we're often ill for a few days, maybe even a week or so, before we really begin to get over it. It's for finding the specific way to kill our pathogen, which takes the time. But when we found it, we can then have an immunity to it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, a way to try and prevent disease is to have a vaccination. A vaccination is essentially a dead or a weakened pathogen being placed in our body. It's not going to cause us too much harm because it is dead or massively weakened. So we shouldn't be at any risk to actually collecting or contracting the disease. That being said, it does allow our body to fight it. So if this was our pathogen, which was particularly nasty, and it had a given structure to it, we might find that we are given a vaccine that looks just like it. However, it's dead or it's weakened. So it's not actually going to hurt us. Yet our body will still figure out the key areas to target. And it will remember that. We will get an immunity. And so if we ever do have the unfortunate position of having the real disease coming into contact with us, we already know how to fight it. It's like having a fight with a boxer. To begin with, you have someone to spar with. You're practicing your technique. You're not going in the ring straight away. And only when you're good and you're suitable and you've figured out what to do, will you go in the ring. So when you do see the real boxer, you'll hopefully be have a way to fight. Now in the exam, you need to talk about positive parts to vaccinations and potential negatives. Well, let's take the vaccination MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. In fact, we can also look at lots of other vaccinations, such as polio. In both cases, the vaccination is having a massively positive effect on the population. Polio is 99% eradicated. We also have absolute reduction in any specific outbreaks, in any epidemics. Because if most people are vaccinated, the disease finds it very difficult to move from one person to the other. And in the case of MMR, it's extremely effective. So the positives of vaccinations are they massively reduce the likelihood of getting a disease that is deadly. To give you some kind of numbers, if you have a vaccination, your risk of MMR is massively reduced. If you didn't have, for example, the measles vaccination, one in 500 people that get measles who haven't had the vaccination will die. So it's massively positive to take them. Now, the negatives, well, there are some. You might find that you have a bad reaction. You might find that actually they're not always 
fully effective. They don't always work perfectly. And in the press over the last few decades, there have been some links. One of the classic ones with MMR was the link to autism. Now, this was completely disproved. This was a study by a chap called Dr. Wakefield, and there was no link to it. But in a public perception, it still remains, even to this day, a little bit. So there is some negative connotations, even if they are factually incorrect. However, the one stat that always reminds me, you have a one in a million chance of having a problem with a vaccination. And we're not even talking a serious problem. Some kind of problem, one in a million. If you counter that to one in 500 die from measles who haven't had the vaccination, hopefully it's a very clear decision on whether or not vaccinations either work and furthermore, should be used. Now finally, when we're talking about diseases, there are two key concepts to be aware of. And they begin with this gentleman, a chap called Semmelweis. He was around in the 1840s and he worked in hospitals. And he looked at some very clear evidence. And it's something we take for granted every day nowadays, but he was the first person to really come up with this. He noticed that the doctors who were working in the hospitals, if they washed their hands, oh, I've drawn six hands in, six fingers, sorry about that. If they wash their hands, we actually find but we massively reduce the amount of disease that is being passed around the hospital. Before that point, because we didn't really know about bacteria, we didn't nearly know about viruses, we didn't think about cleaning our hands. We just thought that illness was caused by something strange. We weren't sure what it was. There weren't really many things we could do. Well, Semmelweis was the chap that suggested having washing of hands, suggested using antiseptics. And so you've probably heard of the phrase, prevention is better than cure. And by preventing the spread of disease, infection rates were massively reduced. But that's not the end of the story, because unfortunately, we have this word here, resistance. And we're going to talk about antibiotic resistance. Now, as we stated earlier, antibiotics kill bacteria. And so you, we should think that everything is great. But as we know with hospitals, we have some diseases, MRSA as an example, which is antibiotic resistant. These are bacteria that you cannot kill with classic antibiotics. They do not die. We need very specialized antibiotics to kill them. And unfortunately with those specialized ones, Essentially, time is ticking out. Well, why is this? Why can some bacteria become antibiotic resistant? Well, if we think about antibacterial resistance with antibiotics, if you took some bacteria and we added ourselves an antibiotic, we should find that the vast, vast majority are killed. However, it only takes one or two that might be slightly different. They might have slight mutations, which allows them to survive. And if they are surviving, 
these bacteria will very quickly replicate. And suddenly, you'll have bacterial infections made up of just these antibiotic resistant type. And so if you got infected with those particular bacteria and you were given the old antibiotic, it wouldn't do anything. They are resistant to it. Now, ways around that, well, we do two things, really. First of all, we don't give our antibiotics readily. We try not to give them out unless absolutely necessary. We also try to encourage people to take the full dosage to not stop halfway through when they feel better. Finally, and is often the case, we give people two, maybe even three different types of antibiotic. So 99% are killed by that first antibiotic. That 1% that are over should hopefully all then be eradicated by the second antibiotic. There should be a tiny proportion that are then surviving. And then, if any survive from that one, hopefully the third one will wipe them all out. But it's a constant battle that we're having, trying to get new antibiotics before too many mutations occur, allowing for resistance. Now, finally, with disease, you might be asked to talk about how you actually grow microorganisms in the lab. Things to be aware of. First of all, in school, we don't go above 25 degrees centigrade when we're culturing the particular plates. We don't do that because we're trying to reduce the harmful for human bacteria. If you think that humans are 37 degrees, if you were growing your cultures at that temperature, you're probably going to be growing organisms that like to infect humans. So in school, we're reduced to that. The second part is that we would always need to make sure that we have a sterile ability to collect our microorganisms. So we might use inoculating loop in a Bunsen burner to make it sterile, to get rid of any previous bacteria. So what's the principle behind it? Well, first of all, you'd use your inoculating loop and you would make it sterile. You'd then swab for the area that you're looking for. You'd then place that onto a growth medium, something like agar jelly. And you'd rub it along the top. You'd then either do one of two things. If you were simply interested in seeing what grows, you'd place a lid and tape it up. If you were interested in finding out if an antibiotic works, you might put a paper disc of antibiotic on there too. And then regardless, we would put a lid around it, we'd tape it up so no more bacteria can get in, and would then put it in for a particular temperature. Again, in the school, must be less than 25 degrees. And we would culture this particular plate. Now, this is when it becomes useful that we've taped it because after a few days of culturing, because it's taped, we're then hopefully not going to have any bacteria which could be harmful escaping. And at that point, we would look at what's grown, has anything grown near the plate, where we are. Now, the only point to make at this point, when we look at growing microorganisms, industry do go up to 37 degrees. In fact, they go beyond that. It makes it a little bit quicker for them, and they're in a position 
where they can be a little bit safer with what they're doing. Okay, let's take a look at a question on disease. Again, you might want to pause it at this point to check that you can answer it yourself and then come back to the live stream. So, for this question, many diseases are caused by viruses. Children are given vaccines to protect them against diseases. Complete the following sentences. It is difficult to kill viruses inside the body because viruses, well, any of the following. The virus itself is inside our own cells. Or, if they're not in our own cells, they're inactive. So, they're relatively difficult to kill. The vaccine stimulates the whole body cells to produce antibodies an ability to detect and kill them. Now for a four mark answer, we're looking at the MMR vaccine. And this is the link to autism. The Japanese government stopped using MMR vaccine. The graph gives information about the percentage of Japanese children who developed autism during the 1990s. The data in the graph supports the view that there is no link between MMR and autism. But why? And we've got four marks here. Well, our first mark would say, essentially, that in 1999, we have 0% vaccinated. So no one is vaccinated in 1999. But if we then look, actually, the autism rate post-1999 is actually going up and down. It's fluctuating. If there was a link with MMR and autism, we'd expect it to instantly drop down. But it doesn't. And so, because it's fluctuating, that is suggestive that because of this autism peak post-1995, autism isn't linked with MMR. The data doesn't suggest it. Okay, for question four, a student is given a tube containing a liquid of nutrient medium. The medium contains one type of bacterium. And this is our classic spelling, punctuation, and grammar question. The student is told to grow some bacteria on the bacteria on agar jelly in a petri dish. Describe how the student should prepare an uncontaminated culture of bacterium in the Petri dish and the reasons for each. Worth six marks. Well, first of all, we're going to get marks for saying we are using sterilized equipment. That could be a sterilized Petri dish. It could be the sterilized agar plate. It could be the sterilized inoculating loop. When they're sterilized, we're then going to get our second mark for saying we're going to take that loop onto the bacteria. We're then going to say that we need a lid with some tape. And we're going to do that so bacteria cannot get in or out. Finally, we're going to need to incubate below 25 degrees centigrade and finally after a given period of time measure the growth 
So we're sterilizing our equipment in readiness. We're then taking our bacteria and running it along the agar plate. We're putting a lid on with some tape to stop bacteria gaining entry or removing entry coming out. We're looking at our temperature and we're measuring our growth. For question four, we have a culture that's been prepared and the student adds one drop of each of five disinfectants. And then the diagram on our Petri dish shows us what's happened three days later. The question, there are areas on the agar jelly where no bacteria are growing. In other words, the white areas that I'm now colouring red. The question is why? Well, quite simply, the bacteria have been killed. The particular disinfectants have worked. C, well, this particular one hasn't. There's no white blob around this particular piece of paper, but all the rest have. And D is most certainly the best one. Okay, that's part two done. Now for part three, they tend to ask one of two question sets. They tend to ask in the exam either a question on nerves or a question on hormones. Unfortunately, you're going to need to know both sets because we don't know which particular set of questions will come up. So let's start with nerves. Now, the nervous system essentially is transmitting information along our nerves very quickly. We have organs which detect stimuli. We have our eyes, our ears, we have nose and skin, different organs to detect what's going on. And we have a central nervous system, which helps coordinate responses. We're going to need to look specifically about how these occur in both reflex, which utilizes the CNS, and conscious responses which has a slightly different take. Specifically though, we need to be aware of this diagram. This diagram is of a synapse. Now a synapse joins two neurons together. It essentially allows the nerves to be very, very long. And it's a chemical diffusion process. Chemicals go across one path to the other to transmit the signal. So please be aware in the exam of synapses, collecting, connecting neurons together. Well, let's take a look at a specific set. I'm gonna start here with a reflex reaction. Now a reflex reaction is one that you want to happen very quickly. It's gonna prevent injury. Let's take an example. If we have someone that suddenly finds that they are near some fire, what's the process? Well, the fire is the stimulus. And it's going to go on to, say, the end of my finger, which has receptors just underneath my skin. We'll then find that this travels up a sensory neuron. And it will go essentially just to my neck, to my CNS. And at this point, these impulses will go around a relay down 
another set of neurons, my motor neurons, and they will make something like my muscles twitch. They will go to an effector, which is my muscle, make them twitch, and I'm given a response. I move my hand away. So this is a reflex response. Stimulus to a receptor, our sensory neuron, which then goes straight back around a relay neuron, down a motor neuron to my effector, and then I get a response. It's quick, it aids protection. Now, there is one slight difference, and this is if we're thinking about a conscious response. So, we have a particular person, and perhaps they see someone who they quite like. Again, we have the same situation going on. We have some kind of stimulus, which goes to a receptor. In this case, this particular person sees the person they like. We then have ourselves a sensory neuron, which takes it to a particular place, but we have a then slight difference. It then goes to our coordinator, our brain. This takes a bit of time. This wouldn't be useful for a reflex response. You're thinking about it. For a reflex response like your eye dilating or contracting in bright light, you want that to be instant or your hand in a hot flame. You want to instantly pull it away. But with a conscious response, it doesn't need to be as instant. So our brain coordinates something. And then we still go back down our motor neuron. We still go to our effector and we still have a response. So our response could be this particular person saying hello or waving around. So conscious response and reflex response. Reflex being very quick, conscious essentially being the same system but we have inside our coordinator. Now, the second main part with nerves and hormones are hormones, and specifically the hormones found within the female, female menstrual cycle. So, first of all, we need to know that a hormone is a chemical that goes around the body in the blood. It's much slower than a nervous response, but it can last for a long time and it's quite generic now the hormones we need to know for the female menstrual cycle are three different hormones i will give you a fourth but these are the top key three ones the first is fsh follicle stimulating hormone it's produced in the pituitary gland, which is in the brain. An FSH causes an egg to mature, gets an egg ready. It also causes our ovaries, or ovaries in women, to produce estrogen. Now, our second hormone is estrogen. And this does two things. Estrogen, which we said was produced in the ovaries, causes the pituitary gland to make another hormone, LH. But it also stops FSH. In other words, we have one egg matured 
And when estrogen gets high enough, because we're inhibiting FSH, we shouldn't get any more matured at all. Now, finally, LH. Well, produced in the pituitary gland, this is what actually stimulates the egg to release. And it's released around about day 14. Now, there is one other hormone, and this is progesterone. And progesterone keeps the uterus wall, the lining of it, maintained. And essentially, with the menstrual cycle, starting at day one, with FSH being released, estrogen then increasing, causing LH, LH to increase, but inhibiting FSH. And finally, at day 14, the egg being released is all about essentially trying to get pregnant. And if by the end of day 28, or roughly thereabouts, that process of pregnancy hasn't occurred, the cycle will start again. Now, the second part with hormones, and specifically the female menstrual cycle, is fertility. The first part here is IVF. If you're struggling to have a baby, one of the early parts that the doctors might give you is the hormone FSH. They might try and increase the eggs that are maturing. If that fails, obviously other parts will then take place. So it will be essentially taking a sperm and injecting it into an egg. But that's our first port of call, IVF, to try and increase the fertility of a woman. Now the second part to all of that is if a woman doesn't want to get pregnant, in which case she might take the contraceptive pill. This works because it has two hormones. It has estrogen in it. It also has progesterone. Well, estrogen stops FSH. And if you've got no FSH, you shouldn't get any eggs maturing. It should ideally stop any eggs from maturing, so you shouldn't be able to get pregnant. It also contains progesterone, so the uterus, the wall lining, remains intact. They're the basic parts of fertility and contraception for the core science exam. Now the final part with fertility, uh, sorry, with nerves and hormones, are plants, and specifically plant auxins. Now, auxins are a plant growth hormone, and they build up to allow the plant to move. And they're moving based on stimuli. We don't call them stimuli for plants. We call them tropisms of which we would have phototropism, geotropism, or hydrotropism. But essentially, the auxin will build up and cause the plant tissue to grow. So in the case of phototropism, the stem will grow towards light. For geotropism, the stem will grow away from the geotropism, whilst the root will grow towards. And for moisture, the root will grow towards the moisture. The final part you need to know with auxins is that they are used for agriculture, for fresh fruit. So if you pick an apple a few days before it's really perfect for eating, it's a little bit ripe, you can transport it without too much of an issue, because it's quite tough. It's not going to bruise. But you don't want to sell that ripe apple 
to the public. So 24 hours or so before it goes on the shelf, having been transported to the local supermarket, an auxin can be sprayed upon it. And that auxin will cause it to ripen. And so when it is actually put on the shelf, it's perfectly edible. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of questions for nerves and hormones. So, a person accidentally touches a hot pan, her hand automatically moves away. So, we're thinking instantly here, reflex. And the diagram shows the structure involved, and I've placed the diagram over here. So, we've got a hot pan and the different parts of the system. The nerve pathway in this reflex action is about one and a half meters in length. And the nerve travels at 75 meters per second. Use this information to calculate the time taken for this reflex to occur. Well, if it's one and a half meters long and it's going at 75 meters per second, that would take 0 0.02 seconds. Now, I know it's a biology exam, but this is why the calculator is so important. You're allowed it, use it, make sure it's correct. Finally, describe how the structure shown in the diagram bring about the reflex. Well, essentially, we're trying to hit the main points again. Our first point is we have a stimulus, the heat. And that will go to receptors on our finger or our skin. It's gonna to move to the CNS and it's gonna move specifically up a sensory neuron. We were gonna have synapses between the neurons, which are gonna have chemical transmitters. Because it's a reflex, we're not going to have a coordinator, but we are going to go to a relay at the CNS. And then finally, we go down after our relay to our motor, which affects an effector, in this case, a muscle, and we get a response of moving. So the stimulus to the CNS via the neurons, a mark for synapses, back down via the relay to the motor, and our effect is to move. Okay, we're on to our final point for question six for nerves and hormones. A student grew a plant in an upright pot. She put it in a horizontal position and left the plant in the dark. Diagram three shows the plotted plant after two days in the dark. Explain why for four marks. Well, be careful here. This is the key part. It's in the dark. You can't be talking about phototropisms making the stem grow up. It's in the dark. There is no light. So here... For a mark, we'll be mentioning gravity, the geotropism. We could say that it goes to the lower side of the plant. The auxin is what is held up on that lower part. And that causes a stimulation of the growth on the lower side. And so my plant grows up. I'm getting a mark for geotropism, a mark for orchis, auxin, a mark for saying the auxin will cause the plant to grow, and a final mark in the upward direction. Okay, here's our final part for this particular hangout. This is homeostasis and drugs. Now on this part, 
The first question is what is homeostasis? Well, homeostasis is keeping the internal environment constant. You're not thinking about this. It's not a conscious response. Specifically, you need to know four forms of homeostasis. Keeping the iron content the same, keeping the water content, keeping the sugar or glucose content, and finally, keeping the temperature constant. Well, for iron, this is where our kidneys are involved. So our kidneys are essentially going to try and remove excess amounts from the blood of our ions if we've got too many and we'll pass them into urine. And if we haven't got enough ions, then that feature won't occur. Now more likely in the exam is probably water, glucose or temperature. Well, water is lost via sweat, via breathing and obviously via passing through when we urinate. Well, the easiest way for our water content to be kept constant is to either increase or decrease the amount of water in our urine. So on a very, very hot day when water is at a premium, our urine won't be or won't have as much water in it. So it'll be more concentrated. It will be a darker colour. But if we've got lots of water, we will probably urinate more often and it will be a much lighter colour. Now for glucose, we require a further hormone called insulin. And with glucose, if we've eaten something very quickly or we've eaten something and we've got lots of sugar that we need to store, we don't want that staying in the blood. It can cause quite severe problems. So if we've got excess glucose, insulin will be released, which will store the glucose from the blood into the cells to be used later on. Now you don't need to worry about how it goes the other way. Simply that insulin will store glucose from the blood into the cells. The final point for homeostasis, keeping our cells the same internally, is temperature. If it's very cold, we might shiver. Very hot, we might sweat. You might also want to talk about vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So on a very cold day, our blood vessels will go deep into our body. On a very hot day, they will go to the surface and we will look red. So homeostasis, keeping our body constant. Now for drugs, and this is our final point of today's hangout, you need to be aware of four different types. First of all, statins. Statins are used to look after people's hearts. High cholesterol, damage to hearts, statins will reduce their risk of heart attacks. The second one that you need to be aware of is cannabis. Links with mental health problems. Lots of nasty chemicals in there, all sorts of issue. The third is steroids, building up muscle. Again, associated problems with it. And finally, thalidomide. Now we'll talk about thalidomide in a minute, but it's very good at the moment for cure curing leprosy. So statins for the heart, cannabis linked to mental health issues, steroids which build up muscle, and thalidomide 
treated for leprosy. But this is where drug testing comes in. Thalidomide was the classic test which failed. It was used as a way to allow people to sleep better. It was also found that it was very good and not having morning sickness in pregnant women. But it was never tested on pregnant women. And when it was delivered, a few years later, there were a huge number of cases of babies born with limb deformalities. The thalidomide was causing the limbs not to develop. And because there wasn't adequate testing on pregnant women, or certainly on pregnant animals, they never knew this link until unfortunately it was too late. So you'll need to know for your exam the stages of testing. Testing to produce safe drugs in the modern world. Well, the first test is on human tissue. Sometimes even before that, they will model it on computers. But they will look on human tissue. Has the drug done anything? Has it caused any particular problems with those tissues? If that seems okay, and this is unfortunate, but the next test will then be on animals. Again, not a very nice thing to think about, but it will be used to see if there's any toxicity, if there's any major side effects. It's better to test it on live animals than it would be on humans. But of course, you've got arguments for it being cruel, it being unethical. If both of those have proved safe, it will then go to human volunteers. And these human volunteers will do a clinical trial. They will see, are there any side effects? They'll look at the optimal dose to use. If that seems to go well, you'll often find with clinical trials that they are done via a double blind test. In other words, the patient doesn't know, or the volunteer doesn't know if they're getting the actual drug or not, and nor does the doctor. And after a given amount of time, they look at the numbers and they will make a decision, did that work or did it not? And this is where the term placebo comes up. So one person might be given a drug with the active ingredient of that drug, another person a placebo, a fake drug that doesn't have anything in it. Now, after all of that, the drug will hopefully then be approved and will be put to market. If there's anything wrong in any of those stages, it won't be allowed. Finally, with drugs, of course, there are legal ones and there are illegal ones. Legal drugs, huge numbers, coffee, tea, alcohol, nicotine in cigarettes, doesn't mean they're all safe. Nicotine is incredibly addictive, thins the vessels in the blood, thins the blood vessels, so all sorts of issues, but it just happens to be legal. And then obviously the illegal drugs, which can be addictive, not necessarily more addictive, but nevertheless addictive, can cause all sorts of nervous systems, body systems. So, that's drugs and homeostasis. Here's our last two questions. Some athletes use drugs containing the steroid testosterone to improve their performance. There's an investigation. 18 male athletes over six weeks. Nine of them are given testosterone. The other nine are given a placebo. And then they're measured after three weeks and six weeks. Question one, suggest the type of placebo. Well, 
this could be any injection as long as it doesn't have testosterone. They wouldn't want another drug in there either, really. So it'd probably be just an injection of maybe something as harmless as water. It would certainly have no testosterone in it. For the second question, describe the results of the investigation. Well, here we can clearly see that the testosterone group, group is significantly above the placebo group in their improvement in a performance bench test. In fact, we've got a number of 12 versus a number of about two. So the testosterone is significantly better. It's about four times better. You'd get a mark for saying that it's improved and a mark for giving a quantity. Now, finally, most internet advertisements for testosterone state that athletes need to use testosterone for at least 10 weeks to significantly improve performance. Do the results of the investigation support this? Well, I think the answer clearly is no. Actually, there is a significant difference after three weeks. There's a definite difference after six. So we could say no, after three weeks or after six weeks, there is improvement. Here's the last question. Question eight. It's a six marker again. And in this particular case, we're looking at the information about cholesterol and the ways of treating high cholesterol. Diet and inherited factors affect the level of cholesterol in a person's blood. Too much cholesterol may cause deposits of fat to build up in blood vessels and reduce the flow of blood. This may cause a person to have a heart attack. There's a key part there. Too much cholesterol, we have a heart attack. Some drugs can lower the amount of cholesterol. We need it. Cells use cholesterol to make cell membranes and some hormones. The liver makes cholesterol for the body. Some drugs can help people with high cholesterol levels. And then we've got some information. Statins, they block the enzyme in the liver that is used to produce cholesterol. People will normally have to take statins for the rest of their lives. They can lead to muscle damage and kidney problems. Using statins for a long time has caused high numbers of deaths. The alternative is cholesterol blockers. They reduce the absorption of cholesterol from the intestine into the blood. Cholesterol blockers can sometimes cause problems if a person is using other drugs. For the six marker, we need to evaluate the two types. Well, my first mark is probably going to come from saying it's better to take either of them, either statin or the blockers are better than not taking anything. Because if we don't take anything, we might result in us having a heart attack. So there's our first point. It's better to take one of these two. Because without them, the risk of heart attack, the risk of a fatal disease is highly increased. We then need to have three or four key points, really, about both. So we could say, I'm going to write S for statin and B for the blocker. We could say that the statin damages organs. That's not great. The blocker doesn't. We might say that the statin, if we use it for a long time, can lead to death. Whilst the blocker doesn't. So at the moment, we're probably in favour of the blocker. We've then got a couple of other different parts. We might say that when we take the statin, actually, we can find that because they're blocking the enzyme in the liver that's used to produce cholesterol, the statin 
should make our cholesterol fall significantly. It might even take it to zero. The blocker will only reduce the cholesterol. It won't bring it down a huge amount. Again, we might talk about the statin being good if someone else is on other drugs because the blocker is going to cause problems. So amongst all of these things, I think overall we might be inclined to say the blocker seems better but it's not to say the statin isn't good. The statin is going to reduce it more because it's going to absolutely block the enzyme. And we can use it if we're on other drugs. But we've got some downsides. We need to use it for the rest of our lives. We can have muscle damage, kidney damage, which the blocker doesn't have. We could even have risk of death. But overall, they're both of benefit because without taking them we're going to have heart attacks and definite problems okay ladies and gentlemen that's the end of this particular hangout we will do a second part of biology later on in the week I hope you found it useful and as always any questions please let us know and we'll try and answer them in the next half an hour or come and speak to any of your science teachers in person to go through. Have a nice evening.